Can you believe it? Did you think it wouldn't happen? The helicopter update is finally here, and it's coming out swinging. With over 34 changes to Armor Reforger's features, this update brings the version to 1.0, and it feels like a whole new game. Just about every aspect of the game has been touched, and in this video, we're going to cover everything you need to know to bring it up to speed. Over the last few weeks, we've spent a significant amount of time testing the new features and trying to understand the supply system. So in this video, it'll be broken into three parts. One, the changes and additions related to the base game from the helicopter update. Two, the supply system. And three, changes and additions related to conflict. There's a lot to cover. This script alone has taken over 40 hours to put together, so if you find this video helpful, please bonk that like button and share it with a friend. Now let's jump in with the General Helicopters update. First up is the keynote feature, helicopters. Bohemia have added the UH-1H Huey for the United States and the MIAMT for the Soviets. Although both are transport helicopters, they're eventually going to be getting weapon systems in the form of rocket pods and crew mounted machine guns. What surprised a lot of people about the addition of helicopters is the attention to detail that Bohemia has put into them. The flight model itself is intuitive and easy to get into, with room to grow should Bohemia ever want to create an advanced system like an Arma 3. The helicopters feel responsive as well as appropriately heavy for their size. Instruments work like you'd expect them to, and the sounds? Oh man, mwah, chef's kiss. Unfortunately, there doesn't appear to be any HODIS, track IR, or Toby eye tracking support, which is noticeably absent for a feature like this. To get the helicopters in conflict, you'll need to be a rank of sergeant, build a helipad and fill it up with the required supplies, then use the action menu on this signpost. Another key feature people have been waiting for is also getting delivered, which is the save and load feature for Game Master scenarios. Now, whatever progress you've made when creating or even playing your scenario can be memorialized within multiple save files. This also seems to work with conflict, if hosted on a LAN or your network. In fact, you can save the state of your conflict match and reload it at a later time. However, supplies and entities appear to get reset. It does not, however, appear to work for combat ops. Speaking of Game Master, Bohemia have also added the ability to pause the simulation in single player Game Master scenarios too, in addition to being available in Armavision. This feature will definitely be useful for content creators like myself who need to capture certain angles and can use a good pausing or two to get into position and make our adjustments. Another major addition is an update to the tutorial. It now covers just about everything you'll need to know about playing Reforger in conflict, from navigation to flying helicopters and capturing bases. So it would appear that you don't need me to make videos anymore. If you've enjoyed drifting across dirt roads and yellowing down the mountain, then you should know that consequences have now been added in with the enabling of vehicle collision damage. Apparently, this was intentionally turned off so Bohemia can see what happens with the physics when we push things to the limit and drive like people do in real life on the 99. But let's be honest, it wasn't all that realistic, was it? Now, whether you're in a helicopter or a Jeep, if you crash into anything too hardly, uh, <laughs> you can expect to go boom, while lighter collisions will result in injuries and even unconsciousness. A new UI has been implemented for the custom map marker feature, which is much more than a visual facelift. Now there's tons more icons you can utilize and the flow of the user interface makes it much more intuitive to use. If you're clicking buttons and confused why nothing is working, it's likely due to changes with control bindings that Bohemia has implemented for both the PC and Xbox. For example, ejecting from your vehicle changed from holding X to double tapping X and rotating the protractor tool changed from holding shift plus mouse drag to holding middle mouse button plus mouse drag. Speaking of changes to the bindings, rumor has it that Bohemia intends to let us remap the controls for the Xbox controller too, enabling me to start using my gamepad again, as well as for console players to choose which functions they want access to the most. New repair, refuel, and rearming features were added in with this update as well and new assets like the construction truck, repair truck, refueling truck, repair a wrench, ammo resupply box, and medic bag enable the full logistical chain with new roles that we can specialize in. For example, with the introduction of helicopters, players can now specialize in being transport and recon pilots. Logi runners can be the quartermasters of their bases and build them up. 
Mechanics can focus on repairing vehicles. Refueling specialists can make sure choppers stay in the air and armor is topped off. Medics can do their medic stuff with the new medic bag, and ammo bearers can keep ammunition supplied to the front lines with the new ammo supply box. With map markers, recon teams can keep everyone updated with intel without ever needing to fire a shot. Snipers can do their snipering, machine gunners can do their machine gunnering, and sappers can go deep into enemy lines to disrupt communications or use the construction truck to build defenses and ambush points in strategic locations. More on that later. So as long as the supply chain holds, everyone can focus on doing their jobs. But we all know that requires teamwork, and with this new update, the team with the best cooperation is likely going to win. So you'll want to get in a group or find some friends to play with. And because this is Arma, no one role is locked out from another. You can mix and match as you see fit. Here are the new trucks and what they do. The construction truck replaces the old supply truck, which has become a transport truck allowing you to load up troops as well as supplies. The construction truck loads up supplies as well, so you can go around and build the fences and objects around the map. Similar to the transport truck, the fuel truck allows you to load it up with fuel and take it to wherever fuel is needed. You can fill up your fuel cans and load them into vehicles, or you can drive your vehicle near and refuel directly. The repair truck is similar to the fuel truck. You want to load it up with supplies and park it next to vehicles that have been badly damaged. Being within the radius will allow you to use a wrench to repair the vehicle, so long as it has supplies. The arsenal truck is exactly what it sounds like, a mobile arsenal that carries all weapons, ammo, and equipment belonging to your faction. Make sure you load it up with supplies, otherwise it won't be very useful. Also, make sure the enemy doesn't find it because they'll have access to your stuff as well. Finally, the mobile command unit allows you to extend your radio signal and also serve as a spawn point for your team. Although you can also load supplies into it, it doesn't appear to be required in order to spawn on it. It also has a 30 second cooldown after it's first deployed, before anyone can use it as a spawn point. There were some medical related updates in this patch too, outside of the medic bag. Although minor, we no longer have to manually drag morphine and tourniquets into the hotbar, as they are now placed there by default. Then there was a good reminder that I should have waited on making my medic video, because in this update we can now load injured soldiers into vehicles. Simply drive up to unconscious players and use the action menu to load them into the vehicle. But wait! The ambulance and field hospital now have a much more important role, and that is for medics to fully heal patients with their medic bag, otherwise they can only partially heal. To use it, be within proximity of an ambulance or a field hospital, and make sure you've treated any wounds with an appropriate bandage or tourniquet first. Then equip the medic bag and complete your treatment. Bohemia has also made adjustments to how we're able to see in the dark now. As it was before, your eyes will adjust to either lighter or darker environments, but now they've made it so that your eyes adjust quite a bit better after dusk. In other words, no more pitch black nights. It's unclear whether this is a temporary change so that matches during the night are now playable and they will revert back to true darkness once flares get added in, or if this is a permanent change. Personally, I'm hoping for the former, because with pitch black nights, decisions need to be made along with their consequences for utilizing light sources. If you've ever gone prone and lamented the fact that your weapon isn't more stable, then it's time to rejoice, because Bohemia has finally added in prone stability. When firing your weapon in the prone position, you don't need to mount on anything for this to work, and it provides the best level of stability, especially if you deploy your bipod. For the audio files out there, Bohemia did some updates with their sound design to incorporate a tinnitus effect if an explosion is too close, causing temporary deafening. Here's what it sounds like. That's also what it sounds like when you shoot a firearm with no ear protection. Your plugs win, Bohemia. And speaking of the sound, I noticed some new bug noises around lakes and trash cans in the form of mosquitoes and flies, respectively. I guess they weren't done with the environmental update after all. And finally, for the base game update, I noticed that handbrakes on your vehicles need to be activated manually, otherwise your vehicle will roll away from you. To do this, hold the handbrake button while you exit your vehicle, and it should stay put. You can also double tap the handbrake button to toggle it on or off. Believe it or not, these were just the changes that we noticed, and there's likely more that we have yet to discover. With that said, let's move on to the new supply system. Quite possibly the most complex addition to Armory Forger is the new supply system, which acts as the in-game economy, particularly in conflict where supplies are the lifeblood of the war. 
After several weeks of testing, I must admit that I am still a bit confused as to the goings on of this system, as there seems to be quite a bit happening behind the scenes. If you've watched one of my earlier videos on the anticipated changes coming with the supply system, then you're familiar with how the system is intended to function. Basically, supplies are needed by almost every service, such as the armory, helipad, living quarters, etc. Although, there's one caveat. In that previous video, I talked about two different types of supplies, construction and ammunition. And for the base game, supplies are now just one simple type, while modders have the option to compartmentalize them further. Almost every action you perform requires supplies, such as repairing vehicles and building defenses. Your equipment costs supplies too, from the ammo you carry to the type of weapon you equip. So here are the main takeaways of this new system. In previous Arma titles, as well as in other games, the in-game economy usually consists of money or points that you earn from doing certain activities. It's a number on a screen that hopefully goes up and to the right, unlike my bank account. However, now in Reforger, the in-game economy is a resource that can be fought over because supplies are now physically present in the world and can be interacted with, transported, and used wherever they're needed. You'll physically see them in storage depots and in vehicles too, so there will be no question if supplies are around. The amount of supplies that a base or location can store is technically not limited, as you can drop them anywhere on the ground and hopefully they won't despawn before you get to use them. More on that in a bit. However, in conflict, the supply depot is gone. No more controls delete them and lose all your supplies at the click of a button. The command tent only holds 600 supplies, so if you want your base to hold more, then you're going to need to build services and deliver supplies directly to those locations, such as the armory, light vehicle depot, and living quarters. This works by loading and unloading supplies to the service that your vehicle is physically closest to, which is important if services are really close together and overlap with each other, which can get confusing, especially since since there's no indication as to what their radius is. To perform loading and unloading, it can be done in a few different ways. First, by using the action menu on the container you're trying to use. Second, by using the signpost at the storage location containing the supplies you want to work with. And finally, by using your inventory screen to drag and drop supplies from one container to another. You want to familiarize yourself with all methods because some methods are required, such as using your inventory screen to transfer supplies from one vehicle to another, since there's no action menu for that. One thing that really confused us about the supply system was how they were being shared with each other. The command tent holds 600 supplies, the armory holds 2100, the living quarters holds 400, the vehicle depot holds 600, and on and on it goes. When you open the map, it will show a base having a certain amount of supplies. But when you go to build something from the command tent, it will show a different number. Then, if you go to a service, it will show available supplies as one number. But when you transfer supplies, it will show a different number. After pulling my hair off for several days, I believe I have an answer. The services in your base have a range in which they will look for supplies. And if that range overlaps with another service, it will see those supplies as being available. Like I mentioned previously, there isn't currently a way to see what that range is. Services appear to share supplies with each other if they are close by, but if you want to load supplies into a vehicle, it will only allow you to take the physical supplies that are at that service. For example, as you can see, this armory can see and use 1860 supplies, but it physically only has 1260 supplies that I can load into a vehicle. Additionally, sometimes services that are placed next to the command tent won't share supplies with the command tent until supplies are done being regenerated into it. I think this might actually be a bug. The rules are supposed to be designed like this. The gray circle is the base supply detection radius. The orange circle is the arsenal detection radius. The blue circle is the support station detection radius. The purple circle is the helipad detection radius, overlapping with the support station for this example. The red boxes are the non-highlighted supply boxes or containers, and the green box is the detected container available to be used by the helipad. However, when testing this system out, I placed an arsenal on one side of the base and a helipad on the opposite end. But the helipad consumed the arsenal supplies, starting with the supplies in the command tent first. It's unclear if this is intended behavior or if there's still wrinkles to iron out in this system, because Mario E from Bohemia has stated that services aren't supposed to be sharing supplies outside of their detection radius. But on the most recent experimental branch, they appear to have the same detection radius as the base itself. So, for some services, like the armory, supplies appear to flow both ways with the command tent. For others, they don't. Get it? Got it?
I guess the main takeaway here is that you need to be aware of where you place your services and design your base in a way that allows for supply trucks and other vehicles to pass through. This leads us to the regeneration of supplies, which is what bases will be doing in conflict. The regeneration of supplies would appear to regenerate services closest to the command tent first and services farther away are filled up last. For example, once the command tent fills up to its maximum, supplies will then start going into the other services, filling those up as well. When the next service gets full, it will then move on to the next, so on and so forth. This is done pretty slowly to ensure that there are no permanently game-breaking scenarios restricting players from spawning in. More about the regen speed later. Next, supplies that are stored outside of a service or vehicle have a decay rate. According to Mario E, the decay rate scales based on how large the stack is. A stack of 100 supplies decays at 34 per minute. At 75 supplies, the decay rate is 17 per minute. At 50 supplies, that rate is 8 per minute. At 25 supplies, it's 5 per minute. At 5 supplies, the decay rate is 1 per minute. And at 1 supply, the decay rate is 0.5 per minute. This decay rate will happen once you transfer supplies onto the ground after about 20 minutes. Which I suppose is fine, but if I'm being honest, Given how important supplies are now, if I place supplies in a backpack or on the ground or even squirrel them away like a little chipmunk so I can come back to it later, I kind of would expect them to still be there when I need them. Let me know in the comments if you feel the same. And finally, additional equipment has been added to the armory that we can equip, such as the ammo resupply box and medic bag, both of which consume supplies. Like mentioned earlier, services have a radius in which they look for supplies and the ammo resupply box and medic bag do the same. In order to ensure that you have supplies so you can rearm or resupply medical equipment while out in the field, you'll need to use the ammo resupply box or medic bag near a vehicle with supplies stored in it. Alternatively, if you want to be more mobile, you can actually equip a backpack and carry supplies in it, or even a few supplies in your pockets too. However, supplies themselves are quite heavy, so plan accordingly. And if you think this has been a lot of changes so far, we're not done yet because the conflict game mode itself has seen some significant updates as well. For instance, one of the major changes to conflict is that the supply depots that we're used to fighting over are now finite in resources, at least for a while. At first they were permanently finite, meaning they wouldn't respawn supplies at all. But people complain that chowder brain lone wolves wasted all the supplies spawning in vehicles for themselves only to die a few minutes later and do it all over again. So now, supply depots will respawn after one hour of actual time. And on Everon, I've been a part of matches that lasted a good four to six hours. There's also been a change to how quickly bases regenerate supplies. Your main base and main objective bases, i.e. the ones in purple, resupply 10 to 12 points every 10 seconds, while minor bases resupply 1 to 2 points every 10 seconds after an antenna goes up. Originally, this update had bases regenerate up to 350 supplies. However, this has been changed to slowly regenerate up to your base's maximum, which can be increased by building more services. For minor bases, this regeneration is very slow and requires supply runs to build them up, which will actually be worth it now, more on that later. For major bases, this regeneration is just enough to make the base more defensible. And if you ever run out of supplies from the depot, or you feel your bases aren't filling up fast enough, Bohemia Interactive have placed hidden supply caches all around the map, making exploration a worthwhile activity to do. My hope is that these hidden supply caches are randomized so that no one game is the same. And while we're talking about supplies, supply runners are now able to rank up faster because the skill points you earn for delivering them has been doubled. And speaking of extra points, if you survive capturing multiple objectives, you'll earn a veteran's bonus, which will give you a significant boost to your career progression for everything you do, so long as you continue to stay alive. Another huge addition to conflict, thanks to the supply system, is that radio backpacks can now be deployed. I know a lot of people have suggested that it's just to copy a squad, but the key difference here is that wearing the radio backpacks has not gone away. In fact, if you wear the radio backpack, there won't be any restrictions. Two radio backpacks can be active at a time, like it was before. And as long as you stay alive, your whole team can spawn on you wherever you are. However, when you deploy it, things are a little bit different. For one, there are 10 spawn tickets. Second, you can't deploy within 100 meters of a base. Third, you won't be able to spawn if there are enemies around within 100 meters. 
Fourth, when you deploy the radio, it's only available for your squad and you won't be able to see other deployed radios. Fifth, only one radio can be deployed per squad. Sixth, it makes a staticky radio sound. And finally, once all the tickets are used, you can pick it back up and use it on your back again. To deploy it, simply remove it from your inventory and use the action menu on it while it's laying on the ground. Radio deployment feels really good, and I hope to see the ability to resupply the spawn tickets in the future to keep it active. Building and disassembly of services, defenses, and objects has changed in a big way for this update as well. It used to be that services would instantly materialize once you place them, leaving some Trollololskis to create fancy Soviet squeeze boxes on unsuspecting players. But now that's gone, because a shovel is used to build everything and tear them down. Now, trolls can no longer disassemble services without physically being present and doing it in front of everyone. Speaking of trolls, the vote kick feature actually works in this new update now, showing you how many votes are needed to kick somebody. You'll have the option to abstain from voting or vote to kick the offending player. Earlier, I mentioned that sappers can go deep within enemy lines and disrupt communications. You do this by using your new shovel toy on the service to disassemble it take down a radio antenna, and potentially cut off the enemy from being able to spawn at that base or capture other bases. It also works to take prisoners and turn them into unpaid labor force, and, well, I'm sure you can figure out some other stuff too. This role is very important for your objectives because of how it impacts capture times. Which is to say, with this update, the capture time for each base scales with how many services are built, making it worthwhile to build up bases so you can have more time for defending an objective. We tested the amount of time it takes to capture, as well as if rank has any effect. What we found was that, whether you're a private or a major, the capture time remains the same. So here's the capture times. A base without any services built will take approximately 60 seconds to capture. One service adds an additional 60 seconds to the capture time for a total of 2 minutes. Two services adds an additional 60 seconds per service for a total of 3 minutes. Three services adds an additional 48 and a half seconds per service for a total of 3 minutes 27 seconds. Six services with three defenses adds an additional 32 and a half seconds per service for a total of 4 minutes and 15 seconds. And finally, we tried adding seven antennas for a total of 10 services and three defenses, and it turned out to be only a total of 4 minutes and 15 seconds to capture. So there would appear to be a limit to how much time you can add with the same service. Looks like Bohemia has her number and is staying one step ahead of us on this one. For now. Speaking of building services, Bohemia has moved the action menu for the building mode that used to be on the signpost on the outside of the command tent to the inside. There are also new prefab services and defenses to build, such as new roadblocks, razor wire, and floodlights that are very useful for nighttime. Before this update, when you or an enemy were capturing an objective and the dominant shifted, the progress bar would come to a complete stop and reset to zero. Now, this isn't the case anymore. When there's an enemy presence that goes against you, the capture bar will begin to reverse back to zero at the same rate that it was progressing. Visually for now, the capture bar will disappear like normal when this happens, but it's still working, so don't be surprised. This next feature was quite controversial when it first was discovered on Experimental. And that's because we can now use the map to teleport to your squad leader or the objective that your squad leader assigns. This feature has a 10 minute cooldown timer once you use it, and it also requires you to know your location. Once you teleport, you'll be placed approximately 250 meters away from your target from the direction in which you started. To use it, simply activate the action menu on the map, select transportation request, select where you want to go, then pinpoint your current location on the map. When I first heard about this, it felt so out of place for Arma. But then, as I thought about it, I'm reminded that conflict isn't Arma. Conflict is just a game mode, and teleportation is a quality of life feature that allows people to stick together with their squad or coordinate as a team. After using it for a while, I began to appreciate the feature, and knowing Arma, I have a feeling this feature will become optional for server providers. I do have to wonder if the people that are leaving angry comments on this video right now are also the same people that hit the respawn button every two minutes so they can teleport themselves around the map, because they're really not going to like this next update. As I alluded to, many players, myself included, would often hit the respawn button to fast travel to certain locations. Bases were never really built up because they didn't really have to be outside of the main base. So if you needed an armory to change your loadout, just respawn at main. Then once you're done, hit respawn again and get close to your objective. And now, with this update, you can't really do that anymore. I mean, you can, if you want to endure a suicide penalty that scales the more often you use it. 
It's important to note that this does not affect you if you respawn while being unconscious. But if you hit the respawn button more than once in a given amount of time, you'll get a penalty, and each tier will add an additional 30 seconds to your respawn time. Where's the ceiling? Frankly, I stopped trying after the sixth tier at three minutes. And no, five minutes between hitting the respawn button wasn't long enough. You'll also lose rank every time you do it too. So here's hoping team killers, war criminals, and griefers get the same treatment. Speaking of griefers, if you play conflict for any length of time, there's a good chance that you've ran into an enemy that picked up one of your friendly radios and started trolling your team with either smack talk or playing loud, obnoxious music or annoying sounds. Frankly, the idea that you can talk to the enemy and feed them false info over comms is a brilliant idea. But seeing as how the internet is filled with chatter brains, we have to constantly stay one step ahead of what the worst among us will do. So Bohemia did a compromise, and as of this update, if you pick up an enemy radio, you can no longer talk on it. The only thing you can do is listen in. Another controversial change is that you can now communicate over VOIP and comms while you're unconscious which makes for some interesting situations. Behind you. Uh, yeah, Behind I you. Up your repal will see. You all right, bud? No. Uh -oh. Sorry, wrong button. Point Montana. Die! Ow! I was just kidding, you know, use a prank, bro! Personally, I appreciated the fact that if you went unconscious, you couldn't continue to communicate with anyone until you woke back up. It led to some tense situations, and I distinctly remember trying to heal someone and slowly coming to the realization that I needed to use a sailing bag. And my unconscious friend was at my mercy, unable to tell me what to do or where enemies are. I know it's just a game, but it made sense. It helped the suspension of disbelief, and it helped to eliminate something I like to call the curse of knowledge in tactical shooters. Let me know in the comments if you're interested in me making a video about that. So here's hoping it also becomes a server option. And finally, the last noteworthy change to conflict was the addition of more FIA barricades around the map that now feature minefields. You'll know it when you see them. And the FIA have roads completely blocked off in some sections, with more fortifications in others, making Eberron feel a lot more lived in. Now, whether or not you like Armor Reforger or the Conflict game mode, there's no denying that it has certainly matured since it was first introduced back in May of 2022. What started off as an okay PvPVE game mode has blossomed into something special, and there simply isn't anything like it on consoles that I'm aware of. As big as this helicopter update is, it's still not the end because there are a ton more features yet to be implemented that will change the game even further. To get an idea of these changes, check out the new updated roadmap video here. If you watched all the way through, I want to thank you for your attention. It really does mean a lot to me. Now if you'll excuse me, I've got some Reforger to play. This is Ironbeard, and I'll see you on the battlefield.